chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. We'll stop reading there until we go somewhere over into the book of Leviticus, but I'll tell you all that when we get there. Now, in this chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon again, putting down some of the wisdom that God had afforded him to understand, verse number one, talks about keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. Now, does anybody remember, not too long ago, when we taught on Solomon and the queen of Sheba, what made the greatest impression upon the greatest or the queen of Sheba about Solomon? What in all this great wisdom? It wasn't the words. It wasn't the fact that he so generously gave the answer to everything that she inquired of him. It was when she saw the way that he went into the house of God. When she saw the way that he behaved, the way that he carefully watched his steps as he was in the presence of God. Then she realized, now I know what makes this man and what makes this country great. It's their God. And here's Solomon talking about how great our God is. Says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. What's that mean? It means watch your step, literally is what it means. But it also means be considerate of your behavior. Because the analogy keep thy foot it means that don't just pay attention to where you're walking but also how you walk okay because let's say god wants you to walk across eggshells don't go around stomping around right you're going to be cracking some eggshells right sometimes it's a light foot approach other times we you know god may instruct us to go and march out onto a hill and having done all to stay and stand there for right to endure hardness as a good soldier of jesus christ but other times he may say hey People, you know, been a little hurt lately, okay? Or that person, they're a little gun shy, right? It may take a word fitly spoken rather than, you know, just coming up and shaking their hand and pulling it out of joint, and then they've got to go have rotator cuff surgery, right? That person, it may not be what that person needs. Okay, now, spiritually speaking, watch your foot. Keep thy foot. We can't just come in and like a bull in a china shop, make our way to our seat, plop down, talk about whatever we want to before the service starts or during the service. I mean, I've been amazed at some of the things that I've heard in, well, he's been here 20 years, so I guess that means I've been here 20 years. But over the course of 20 years, during a handshake, the things that people will talk about in God's house. Handshake is not time to talk about what we want to talk. It's about getting in the one mind, in one accord, having the same heart through fellowship, through the coming together of the brethren, so that we can dwell in unity, so that God can sit down among us. That's the time to talk about how good God's been. It's the time to talk about, hey, you're looking a little down. God just told me to tell you that, hey, he's still on the throne. Or, hey, you remember when you did this last week? God really used you. It's not a time to talk about the weather and everything else under the sun. This is God's house. This isn't a pulpit. This is God's pulpit. Amen. This isn't carpet. It's God's carpet. Doesn't matter where the money came from, every brick and every bit of mortar that put this building together didn't come from man. It was provided by the grace of God, given through the power of God, and it belongs to God. In just a building, this is God's building. That's the point that Solomon's trying to get across. This isn't just a meeting place. This is the house of God. Not that he dwells in brick and mortar. Not that he lives in the confines of a stone building that man can make. But this is the house that God says, this is where people who are called by my name will remove themselves from the world so that I can make my presence known among them a separate from the world. To show the world that I don't meet with the world, I meet with my people on my terms in my place. That's what Solomon's saying. Keep thy foot. 
tread carefully because this isn't carpet. That's God's carpet. That's not a pew. That's God's pew. And if we want to go one step further, that's God's pew. And he put it there because he knew that one day you'd be sitting there. That's the place that God designated that you would come and hear what God wants you to hear. This is God's altar that he put there so that you could come and do business with God while you're at the house of God. Amen. But people don't think like that anymore. People think, well, going to church and church is the building. No, the church is the people. The building is the grace of God that he gave us a place where regardless of rain, sleet, snow, whether it's nighttime, whether it's daytime, we've got a place that we can meet with him. And he blessed us with air conditioning. And regardless of what the temperature is outside, we can usually get it to the temperature that we want. But no matter what that thermostat, thermostat says, I'm always sweating by the time I'm done up here. Right? But it'd be a whole lot worse if it was 90 degrees, Brother Bob, and I was up here preaching. Right? I'd probably I'd be liable to die of a heat stroke every week. But see, we don't think about it that way anymore. We don't think that this is a gift from God. I mean, we should treat the house of God like every first-time mother treats a newborn baby. She looks at that baby and sees a gift from God. And I've heard the old adage that the second kid, they're not as careful as they were with the first one because they've learned that, you know, a dirty pacifier or one that fell on the ground for a half a second, it's not going to kill the kid, right? But the first time around, they got to go boil it and they got to go clean it and do everything else to disinfect it. When, you know, by the time the third kid comes around, they don't even wipe it off anymore, right? <laughs> but no, a first time, uh, they see a gift, of God, a blessing of God. They cherish that. We should cherish the house of God. Yes, the hands of man erected it. But God gave those men the ability to do it. God provided the means to have it done. And especially when he's laid it on our pastor's heart, to start another building program, do you really believe that God will bless us with another one if we don't cherish the one we already have? Amen. Solomon saying, Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. What is the point of the house of God? The purpose. Not so that we have a place to come, but so that we have a place to hear. If we wanted to congregate, we could congregate anywhere outside in the world. But this is a place that God has said, no, this is where you will hear from his man. This is where the under shepherd will stand week in, week out, and deliver what it is that thus saith the Lord for this specific congregation. It's where God says, you want to hear, you have to come here. It's a place where he promises to deliver a message. That's why the book of Revelation talks about the pastors as the angels, the seven angels of the churches in Asia. What are angels? Messengers from God. The house of God is worthless without a message. Why do you think that the word Ichabod is so you know, haunting to hear about, to hear preached about, because it means that there's a building there, but God's not going to darken those doors for at least seven years. If God stamps Ichabod on a building, it means you can come all you want, but God's not going to speak. Ichabod means that the glory departed. You can go through the routine. You could try everything that you can think about. You can be like those foolish individuals that were worshiping Baal on the day that Elijah prayed fire down from heaven you can do everything shy of killing yourself in the name of trying to hear from God but God won't speak if Ichabod's on the door and you want to know why that happened because long before people stopped keeping their feet when they went into the house of God long before people stopped caring about hearing and they were more interested in being heard Can we not agree that this is God's house? Amen. So shouldn't we all endeavor that
that everything that we say while we're in God's house be sanctioned by God? Be directed by God? Sometimes we're far too willing to say what we want to say or to, we could take it one step further, think about what we want to think about. Sing the song however we want to sing and not asking the question, well, Lord, what would you have me do when I get to your house? Because I'm a member of the church, but this isn't my church, this is God's. We've already covered that. It is my privilege to be able to come. And if he impresses upon my heart to say something, I want to make sure that first I'm more ready to hear, but if he does tell me to say, I say according to what he wants me to say. Anybody else ever notice that there are just some people that if the pastor asks for testimony and their hand goes up, the service is deader than a hammer by the time they're done. That's not coincidence. You ever notice how some people very rarely testify, but when they do, it seems as if God's, you know, orchestrated everything that they say, and it just edifies everything that's already been going on in the service? That's not coincidence either. They were more ready to hear, but God said, well, hey, no, I know you're ready to listen, but it's your time to say something. And I may be wrong on this. But if I ever say something, I've got to have God just about yank me up out of the seat because I'm so terrified that I don't want to ruin a service. And every now and then, I've had those services where I, he says, hey, get ready. But he doesn't say, get up and do. And then somebody will kill it, and then he says, never mind. Why, because some people are not more ready to hear they want to give the sacrifice of fools considering not that they do evil you're not on your time when we come here this is God's time and we get here and there is no schedule there is no time that well we'll make sure that everybody's out of here by now because today is not Jordan's day this is the Lord's day that means that I've given over the entire day, not to what I want, but to what he wants. If he wants to keep me here till midnight, it's the Lord's day. It's not mine. And some people come in, and they've got the schedule, the routine, well, we're going to be here for about this long. No, no, no. Or they come in and they say, well, I really think that I ought to sing this song. Well, did God put it on your heart? Or do you think that you're going to sing that song? Did God tell you to say it? Or is that something that you want to say? Because the difference has a great impact. Not just on the service, but on you for eternity. If I kill a service and there's somebody in that service that could have been saved, that otherwise, if I wouldn't have done what I did, they would have gotten saved. That person's blood's going to be required at my hands when I stand before Christ. Because of my sacrifice of foolishness, I've done evil in the sight of God because one person's going to die and go to hell. People have forgotten how serious it is when we come here. I don't care what time it is. Now granted, there have been times I've been sitting in service and I've gotten a little hungry, but I promise you this, I can make it a day without eating. I think all of us can make it. And those that can't, thankfully their moms usually have some snacks in the bag that they brought with them and they can hold them over for a while. But I can't promise you this, if God's in it, you won't get hungry until the service is over. If God's in it, all that food on the other side today isn't going to go bad in the time that we're sitting here. So we got to nuke it, okay. We got ovens and we got microwaves back there. We can get it back to real good eating condition because God's been so good to us. But see, this is not our church. This is not, well, our fellowship hall. No, no, no. This was hollowed and sanctified under God. 
That means it's his and he gets to use it however he wants. And if we don't like it, biblically, it's literally God's way or you leave. Because those are the only two options. And if you're right with God, you should endeavor that everybody get on God's page or leave. Because if they don't come ready to hear, if they come purposed to make the sacrifice of fools unto God, they're doing evil. And we don't want evil done here at the house of God. Because if evil is done, we're one step closer to Ichabod. If evil is done, we're one step closer to God removing our candlestick or our pastor and placing it somewhere else. We should endeavor that everything that we do not just bring glory and honor unto God, but is not only the will of God, but done the exact way that God wills it in the exact perfect timing that God wants us to do it. Because today's his day. We're going to read, I'll go ahead and turn over there. Y'all don't have to, I'll read it to you. But it's Leviticus chapter number 26, verse number 2. It says, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. Well, we don't keep the Sabbath anymore. We keep the day that the Lord got up out of the grave. That's the Lord's day. Sunday. But why do we keep that day? Because it is given unto God. I don't work on this day unless I'm providentially hindered. Right? Unless there's a way that the only way I'm not making it to the house of God is that God allowed it. That's what providentially hindered me. That it was orchestrated in the will of God that I wasn't here. But the Lord's day, we don't work. And those that do, they desire to be here. Okay, but we don't set business meetings, you know, for secular businesses. I mean, we've had business meetings for the church on Sundays, but that's because yearly the state makes us and we just get it out of the way or usually pretty early in the year. I'm sorry, we don't schedule business calls at 1231 because we think we're going to be out of church at 1230. But how many other things do we plan on doing on Sundays that have nothing to do with God? This isn't a day that we reserve unto God however long we're in the house of God. No, no, no. This whole day is for the glory, honor, edification, and the propagation of the Lord's work. Amen. He should get all the glory from this day. And we should do whatever grows his work. You want to know why God used to show up for hours? You know, they'd start at about 10 and they'd get out of here at about 4. You want to know why that used to happen? Because people said, Lord, the whole day's yours. They came to get in. Not to just take a pit stop and then go back out to the world. They were ready and they were and their children knew. We're staying as long as God's at the house today. I walked in one service. I may have been running late, which again, my fault. But I think it was on a Wednesday night. I saw somebody, somebody was doing a dance from, I believe it was Fortnite. And in the flesh, I wanted to about backhand that kid. But see, at one point, nobody would have dared to have done that. At one point, if we go really far back, you know, 1700s eras, they'd liable to shoot you if you did something that dishonored the house of God. Because that's how serious they took it. Because this isn't a building, it's God's building. If someone threw a rock and vandalized the church house, they weren't committing a sin against man or a crime against man. That was a crime against God. And they viewed it that way. What has changed? People have become more casual. But God still says, keep his Sabbath. Reverence his sanctuary. The place that he comes and sits among men. Now he lives and dwells inside of us, but there are just sometimes he sits down among us. Why does that happen? Because they have come to the place where God said it was his will for us to meet him at. And they do things according to his will so that God can show out. He always wants to, but it's whether or not we're willing to do what is required for him to show out.
sometimes the best services are the ones where there's not a lot of people talking. There's people crying in altars. There's people going privately to other people. And the preacher's just up here directing traffic, waiting on God. You want to know why those happen? Because people aren't concerned about being heard. They're concerned about hearing what the Spirit has for them to do and then doing it. Keep that foot. Then, keep your deeds so that we don't do the sacrifice of fools. But then, we go to our mouth. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. You want to know a real good sign that somebody doesn't know what they're talking about? They can't shut up. They're trying to take a whole lot more of your time and use a whole lot more words to convince you that they know what they're talking about when somebody who did know what they were talking about could have gotten a point across long before that. True wisdom is being able to answer a question in the fewest words possible but still answer the question. Somebody will ask you, well, how do you do this? Short and simple to the point. Answer them. Somebody that doesn't know, well, I think, you know, you do this and do that, but if that isn't right, you can do this. And then they're talking and talking and talking, and then before you know it, it's your next birthday. There are just some people that are that way. But it's nearly a telltale sign of somebody being foolish. Someone come, somebody comes into the house of God and they can't stop talking about themselves or the things that they did this week. There's a good chance that they're being rash with their mouth. Even if God told them to do it or not to come here and to tell everything that God wanted us to do for Him this week. I mean, we can go into... The New Testament where the Apostle Paul said, if everybody got up and preached, if everybody got up and sang, if everybody got up and taught a Sunday school lesson, we'd be here until the Lord comes back. That's where we get the teaching that it should be done in decent and in order. We all can get up and say what God's done for us this week, but does God will us to do, or will us to get up and tell what He did for us this week? Does God will for us to do or to listen? Rash with our mouth means there's no thought in it. We just pop off. We get caught up in emotion. And if emotion is all that you have down at the house of God, one, you're very shallow, but two, also, God's not going to show up. Because God's not an emotion. He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And if you worship God, there's going to be some emotion, but it's not about emotion. It is about Him and the truth behind what he has done for you. You really get a hold of what God's done for you, you're going to have an emotion. You're going to start crying. You're going to start shouting. You may do a head first slide into the altar just to thank him for how good he's been to you. But the key to that is it's not about you. And it's not rash. It's something that he burdens deep down in here and he's dealt with you with. And then eventually... Just like, you know, a tea kettle, that steam starts coming out and you got to do something. That's not rash. That's God doing something in you that he wants you to do outwardly also. That's being sensitive to know when it's God's timing. But those that are rash are those that give no thought to what their actions have. They think, well, I said something in the house of God. I must, you know, I, d I did something good this week. But just because you can sing doesn't mean God wants you to sing. Just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean God wants me to preach every time the doors are open. In fact, you know, I consider myself lucky that I get to do it once a week. And then I don't have the responsibility of answering people's questions afterwards. Most of the time, people got issues. They don't call me. They call the pastor. I'm just a Sunday school teacher. I mean, every now and then I'll see... Brother Mike and Sister Lisa and now Brother Charlie because they come over to Sister Sheila's doctor's office. I see them over there every now and then. But that's not because they're, you know, hey, can you help me with this or help me with that? I'd be happy to, but hey, I'm not the pastor. Right, I get to get up and give what God's 
told me to give it, and I get to sit down and hear what I need to hear. Pastor's got to get up four times a week because he also does Sunday school in his own office, and he's giving to people every time. And it's a whole lot harder to get from God than it is to give to people. So at least four times a week, God's preaching to him the exact same message. And it's a whole lot easier to hear a message than it is to have God purpose it in your heart first. And those that never stand up behind a pulpit really don't understand the burden of carrying the message that God wants you to deliver. They don't understand how you have to watch every word that you say when you're behind a pulpit. Because I'm not up here as Brother George. People that come in, especially if they're lost, or even say folk, even though it shouldn't, they see me as a representative of God. I mean, biblically, I can show you that that's not true. I'm just a mailman. But that's how they see it. So we have to be careful with the words from behind the pulpit. But if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I should be careful of every word that I say, not just once service has started, but from the time we come in to the time that we go out. From the time that we're in the parking lot until the time we get home. And because people stop watching what they say at the house of God, they stop watching what they say out in the world. Because if we're comfortable doing it on God's property, in God's presence, we don't even consider the fact that we take him with us when we go, if we're saved, because he lives and dwells inside us. Brother Greg said it the other day. We grieve the Spirit because we make the Spirit do the things that the Spirit doesn't want to do. Amen. So if we can do it here, boldly in front of God, I can guarantee you that we're doing it out there. I mean, I've heard, you know, well, people put on a show when they come to church. Well, those people that put on a show here at church, there are a lot of them that aren't putting on a show at church, but they put on a show out in the world whether it's because they want acceptance, whether or not it's just because they don't want friction. But if you can't be real and transparent at the house of God with those that have a brotherly love for you, for those who are instructed to bear your burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, if you can't be transparent around other people that know that they don't deserve anything from God, they deserved hell and God saved them and they're thankful for it, if you can't be yourself around them, I can guarantee you you're not going to be yourself in the world. If you can't let Christ live through you at the house of God, you're not doing it outside. And if we treated the house of God like it was the house of God, if we treated the things that we do in the house of God like we were doing them and God was right there watching us, because he always is, if we treated the words that we say as if we were uttering them before the throne of God, because we are, then we'd be more likely to live that way outside of these walls. But what is the reason that all of these things start taking place? Well, we can go back over to the book of Leviticus 26. It says, Ye shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. That's a, that's a very simple verse. I mean, I don't understand how you can mess that one up. Why do we keep his Sabbath or the Lord's Day? Why do we reverence his sanctuary? Because he is Lord. Not a Lord, the Lord. I am the Lord. We keep his Sabbath because the very God that created heaven set aside a day for us to come out and to worship him. He made everything in six days and on the seventh he rested. So we take that day that he rested well actually if we think about it if God said let there be light on Sunday we worship him on the day that he created light. I don't know. I wasn't there. Can't tell you. Not written in the Bible. Okay, Maybe he rested on Sunday. Maybe he rested on the Sabbath which is Saturday. But either way, there's a day that God set aside for us to worship Him. And we keep it, not because we don't have anything better to do. 
And people have been trying to wedge out pieces of the Lord's Day for years. Well, I'll go to church as long as it don't go past this because I've got to go do this or I've got to go do that. I mean, thankfully, most businesses are still closed on Sundays. Originally, that was because people knew that Sundays were the Lord's Day. Originally, that was because people feared working on Sunday because they were afraid of what God would do to them if they weren't in the house of God. But nowadays, it's just carried over because that's tradition. And a lot of them have been breaking that for years, not just recently. Because they don't reverence the Lord's day. They don't keep it because they have no fear of the Lord. No reverence towards Him. Why would you treat this building any different than any other building if you don't think that the one who owns it is any special? Why would you, you know, care about coming to His house on the days that He set forth? That He opens the doors and says, Come and dine. Why would you show up if you didn't think anything special about the one who opened the doors? Why would you reverence his sanctuary, revere it, fear it, step in caution because you don't want to do anything out of order? Why would you do that if you didn't think that the one who provided the building, who sustains the building, who keeps the doors open week in and week out, was a thrice holy God that sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for your sins people that don't think the house of God's any special or people that don't think that the Lord's any special because if you think that he's worth worshiping you'll consider the house of God a place worth worshiping in if you think that God truly does care about every detail of your life you'll be sure to look at all the details of the things that you do while you're at the house of God. And is God against laughing? Is God against having a good time? No. But when we do those things for the sake of, you know, trying to impress somebody, because we want that person to think that we're special, when we do those things because we're not concerned about what's going on in the house of God and we're just trying to entertain ourselves while we're here yeah he's got a problem with those but a word fitly spoken still very valuable somebody may be having a bad day they need somebody to remind them it's not all doom and gloom so that they can worship if God tells you to do it that's the one rule that we have but if God doesn't don't and be certain exercise discernment because I guarantee you that if God's intending on doing something the devil's intent on trying to interfere so try the spirits whether you know that God wants you to say it or it's a thought that the devil put in your mind how do you know well the spirit will lead and guide you into all the truth if you ask God he'll show you if you're willing to deny the flesh and humble yourself before God, He'll reveal it. But you don't humble yourself before someone that you don't revere. You don't humble yourself before someone that you don't fear. You don't humble yourself before someone when you walk in thinking that you own the building. No. This is God's house. If we could peel back that layer that sinful man has on his eyes and we could see all the prayers that went in to this building being completed not just now I'm talking like back in 1500s Europe when people are begging God Lord give us a place that we can call yours where they don't persecute us and they don't try to kill us for worshiping you in spirit and in truth and when those people came over to a new land where they could seek religious freedom, originally there was only one place that you could be a doctrinal Baptist. That was Rhode Island. In the beginning. And those people got a burden. Lord, we know that there are people throughout the other colonies that believe like we do. Give them a place that's yours where the world can't touch it 
And the world can't interfere with what's going on inside of that building so that you can meet with your people there too. And then eventually one day, somebody got a burden. Lord, put a church in the middle of Florence, Kentucky. And then if we could look at all the blood that was shed by the saints as martyrs so that we could have this building, we'd look at it a little bit different. If we'd look at it just seeing the prayers of those I'm here today, Lord, keep the doors of this place open so that my lost ones can get saved. But if we could really go to the Alpha of time and see the love that God had for this community, and He said, one day, I'm going to put a jewel right there. Amen. And for a while, it's going to be rough. For a while, it looks like they're, you know, as lost as a ball in high weeds. But then one day, I'm going to do a work. And we're going to turn that old rinky-dink building into a fellowship hall. I'm going to give them a new building. And then put a vision on the pastor's heart to extend once more because they need more room because they just keep growing. And if we could see everything that God orchestrated from the inception of Emmanuel Baptist Church until now, we'd have a greater appreciation and reverence for his sanctuary. Because we understood that man couldn't have made all that work out. Man couldn't have kept the doors open for that long in the power of the flesh. Man couldn't have known what man of God needed to be there to found it. Man wouldn't have known how to keep the doors open. Man wouldn't have known that the Howe family were the ones that were going to be the deciding vote. Man wouldn't have known any of that. But God did. And God put people exactly where they needed to be, exactly when they needed to be there, so that we could still have this place. Some of them just come in, blow in, blow out. Give no thought to it. Well, we're just going to church. No, you're going to God's house. Well, I'm just going to plop down and enjoy it. No, no, no. That's God's view. I don't care if you've sat there since the day the doors of this building were open. I've moved a couple of times. But if you've sat in the same place, that's not your spot. That's God's. It's only by the grace of God that that pew now conforms to you because God's let you sit there that long. But why does God, because he has a purpose for you being here. And if we just ignore it, if we're willing to spout off and say whatever, if we're willing to come in and do what we want to do rather than what God wants to do, he's just liable to remove us to where we don't come in and don't hinder his work anymore. Because we're without chastisement, we're a bastard, not a son. If we're in the way of what God wants to do, he's liable to move us. So we ought to come in and we ought to say and act and do as unto God because we are doing and acting and saying as unto God. Because if I do different, I consider not that I do evil. Not wrong, evil. Because it's the exact opposite of what God wants to happen. There's either holy or there's evil. So be ye holy as he is holy. And don't do evil in his house. Because this is the last place that we would want to mess up. Or we should want to mess up. This is the last place that we should want to commit sin. And if that means that we've got to humble ourselves and crawl into the building from now on, then do it. If it means that you've got to do something different in your daily routine or in your Sunday routine, then do it. Because this isn't our time, God's time. On God's day, in God's house. So we ought to be wholly reserved to do what God wants us to do. But so many are just white knuckling through the service so that they can get out and go do what they want to do. You're already here. Might as well just get, get in. Do what God wants you to do. I promise you, you'll enjoy the rest of the days of the week a whole lot better. But so many come in and they're biting their nails and they're white knuckling. Just say, well, I wish that preacher would shut up. Well, stop being in the way and get in the way. Amen. I'm in the way, the bright and shiny way. Yeah, I'm in the glory land way. So is God. He's the one that paved it. So get in. It's the one that he wants you to walk anyway. But see, we just blow, we don't think about those things. These aren't lights. They're God's lights. 
It is God's power that keeps them on. Because every month, God makes a way for the power bill to be paid. We don't think about that. And we ought to. We should have it ingrained in our heart. And when we come in here, I'm going to do as God wants me to do. Because today, it's his day, he gave me the grace to get up out of bed, to make it here, to still have it to where I could breathe his oxygen that he put in the air. So I'll just do what God wants me to do. And instead of fighting against him, I'm going to go with him. If we start doing that, we'll see things in the house of God that we've never seen before in this generation. Because the old generation knew how to worship. Because when they came in, they really did appreciate the opportunity to sit down and hear what God wanted them to hear. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.